I can think of no better exemplar of what independent film should be than Beasts of the Southern Wild. So, so I sent him this play about, uh, that I'd written about my own father when, when he got sick and how that changed our relationship. I sent it to Ben and about a couple of months later he came to me about wanting to take these characters and set it in South Louisiana where he and start to make that a character in the story. So that's where the, that's where it, Beard off. And, and the great thing about film is, you know, forgetting even about the aesthetic side, which was very important too, is just if you've got a, you know, beautiful little 16 millimeter camera and a few rolls of film and a changing bag, you kind of can't be stopped shooting. You know, you can be in the middle of nowhere as we frequently were, and it can be, you know, baking hot and I'm being assaulted by all kinds of bugs, but the camera will just keep going. And I just didn't trust any of the, you know, the digital technologies at that time. As we did the casting, as we had kids play the scenes, we actually realized a lot about the character that it worked better as a girl and that also we, we lowered the age from, originally we wrote it at about 10 years old thinking that was the minimum age that we could find somebody who could act basically. And, but as we looked at kids for months and months, um, you know, we, we realized that the voice of this character was really the voice of a six year old. And so all those sort of revelations happened as we cast the film for nine months while we were writing. Do you still like the movie? It's been a while since you made it. Yes. What's your favorite part? Every part with seafood in it. <laughs> so she ultimately had the final say so who was going to play her father. I own a bakery in New Orleans called the Buttermilk Drop Bakery and Cafe. <laughs> so what I did with Nazi when they told me they was bringing it down, bringing me down there to her, I brought packed a whole bunch of buttermilk drops, brownies, donuts. They were delicious. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> And I packed them in these pretty little boxes. And when I went to home, and they said, that's Nazi right there. I looked at it. I had them boxes in my hand. And then I walked up to her, and I handed her them boxes. She opened them up and put that big old smile on her face. And I knew I had to part then. No one touched that box. And she was able to sort of take anger, turn it into loneliness, take loneliness, step on attack, and be in pain and lonely at the same time. She was, I started feeding her all of these complicated, conflicting emotions and she was able to pivot in them and uh, we were just absolutely shocked. I mean, I, he was a fun kind of guy. He it, made you laugh? Yeah. He made me laugh on the inside. I wouldn't laugh on the outside. But. <laughs> he make you do it over a lot? Did he keep saying do it over again? Yes, he would aggravate me with one more time. Um, when he said one more time, he actually meant five more times. <laughs> I think Hush Puppy's a warrior of the heart, and Quivangene brings that so well that she's this amazing warrior of love. Thank you all so much for coming. Go buy the soundtrack, buy a record player. <laughs>